So throughout this module, there has been, I think, an implicit assumption that populism is not very good for democracy. But is that really the case? Like most things in political science, how you define your concepts influences how you will see the case, right? How you will see populism depends on how you define it. If we think of democracy without adjectives, then it is perhaps not so clear cut that populism is a bad thing. So democracy is best defined as the combination of popular sovereignty and majority rule. Nothing more, nothing less. Hence, democracy can be direct or indirect, liberal or illiberal. So it's no coincidence that most minimal definitions consider democracy first and foremost as a method by which rulers are selected in competitive elections. Free and fair elections thus correspond to the defining property of democracy. Instead of changing rulers by violent conflict, the people agree that those who govern should be there by virtue of being elected by a majority of the electorate. For Ross and Vallon, populism should be conceived of as a perverse inversion of the ideals and procedures of representative democracy. On the other hand, philosopher Leclerc argued that, actually, populism is the only true form of democracy, according to Mudd and Kaltwasser anyway, with the philosopher arguing that populism fosters a democratisation of democracy by permitting the aggregation of demands of excluded sectors. Essentially, it brings in the voice of those who were previously excluded from the democratic process. However, it's not a stretch to see that populism might actually be good for democracy. So, for example, if a populist party is articulating in favour of the interests of a much maligned group in society, or speaking up for an issue pushed off the table by elites, then it could be good for the democratic system for populists to be bringing this into the electoral sphere. It acts as an escape valve for the pressure building up in the democratic system. Uh, we can see that perhaps in the original classic populists in Latin America. On the other hand, I'm sure we can all think of examples where populists, in their us v them rhetoric, exclude minorities, undermine key institutions, and overly moralise issues. As a result, for Budden Kaltwasser, depending on its electoral power and the context in which it arises, populism can work either as a threat or a corrective for democracy. The context is important. However, if we move away from the idea of democracy with our adjectives and towards liberal democracy, which is normatively seen as the ideal type of political system by most people, even if they don't realise it, and you might disagree, then populism runs into more problems. If we think of liberal democracy as a political system which not only represents popular sovereignty and majority rule, but also establishes independent institutions specialised in the protection of fundamental rights, such as freedom of expression and protection of minorities, free press, etc., essentially a system or set of institutions that aim to prevent uh, the emergence of a tyranny of the majority, well then it should be fairly clear uh, that populism is the threat. Right? We only need to think of places like Hungary or Poland where populists in power have curtailed the role of the media, threatened institutions like universities, or Italy where populists have railed against the role of judges in politics. This is often done through recourse of concepts or principles like popular sovereignty or the will of the people or even common sense. In short, populism is essentially democratic, but it's at odds with liberal democracy, the dominant model in the contemporary world. Populism holds that nothing should constrain the will of the pure people and fundamentally rejects notions of pluralism and, therefore, minority rights as well as the institutional guarantees that protect them. So, as a threat to liberal democracy, populism exploits the tensions that are inherent in liberal democracy, which tries to find a harmonious equilibrium between majority rule and minority rights. It does this by criticising violations of the principle of majority rule as a breach of the very notion of democracy, arguing that, ultimately, political authority is vested in the people and not in unelected bodies. In essence, populism raises the question of who controls the controllers as it tends to distrust any unelected institution that limits the power of the demos, the people, uh, understood via populist actors, populism can develop into a form of democratic extremism, or better said, a liberal democracy. In this understanding then, populism does not provide a comprehensive political ideology, but focuses only on the way in which power should be organised and legitimised in democratic society. We can see that, in terms of liberal democracy, populism harms the idea of public contestation, but strengthens political participation. 
Public contestation is harmed because populists see certain actors, the elite, as morally corrupt or evil, and hence they shouldn't play a role in politics. To that end, uh, populist forces are prone to highly charged rhetoric and conspiracy theories. For instance, Syriza politicians in Greece would prefer to domestic opponents as the fifth column of Germany and one of its now former ministers even call the EU terrorists. On the other hand, populism tends to favour p- political participation since it contributes to the mobilisation of social groups who feel that their concerns are not being considered by the political establishment. At its core belief is that the people are sovereign. All the people, and only the people, should determine politics. I think it's important that we don't instantly associate uh, populism with radical right populism, which I admit is is very easy to do, right? Uh, It takes a level of critical self-awareness to decouple these biases. So when we look at populist radical right parties in Europe, uh, we can see that the attempts to limit uh, political participation by excluding certain minority groups is often very... uh, consistent but these groups are excluded from the native people uh, and not the pure people in other words it is the nativism and not the populism that is at the basis of this exclusion in summary populism can play both a positive and negative role for liberal democracy for instance by giving voice to constituencies that do not feel represented by the elite populism works as a democratic corrective populists often do this by politicizing issues that are not discussed by the elites but are considered relevant by the silent majority and that's in inverted commas indeed without the presence of populist radical right parties in europe immigration would probably not have become a uh, significant topic for mainstream political parties in the 90s Uh, The same can be said about economic and political integration of excluded sectors in contemporary Latin America. The topic has become one of the most pressing matters in the last decade, to a large extent due to the rise of left-wing populist presidents who successfully politicised the dramatic levels of inequality in their countries. But populism can also have a negative effect on liberal democracy. For instance, by claiming that no institution has the right to constrain majority rule, Populist forces can end up attacking minorities and eroding those institutions that specialise in the protection of fundamental rights. That is the main threat posed by populist radical right parties to liberal democracy in Europe and, as we've seen, populist radical left parties. Aiming to construct an ethnocracy, a model of democracy in which the state belongs to a single ethnic community, populist radical right actors undermine the rights of ethnic and religious minorities, such as Muslims in Western Europe and Roma gypsies in Eastern Europe. For Mudden Kaltwasser, however, the role of populism on democracy is not as clear-cut as simply good or bad. Instead, they argue that the impact of populism varies on the stage of democratic development or backsliding a country finds itself in. First, they identify four distinct phases of democratisation. Full authoritarianism, where there's no space for political opposition and there is systematic repression. Competitive authoritarianism, where the presence of an opposition is tolerated, elections are conducted, but the latter are systematically violated in favour of office holders. Electoral democracy, a periodic realisation of elections in which the opposition can potentially win, but with a number of institutional defects that hinder the respect for the rule of law and exhibit weakness in terms of independent institutions seeking protection of fundamental rights. And in liberal democracies, not uh, unperfect, but the governed have more opportunity to hold the authorities accountable, ranging from a robust public sphere to independent judicial oversight. So depending on a country's trajectory, populist parties can either have a positive or negative effect on democracy. During liberalisation, populism helps articulate demands of popular sovereignty and majority rule, which call into question existing forms of state repression. They can help unify all those opposed to a regime, e.g. the role some populist actors played in broad opposition movements in communist Eastern Europe, most notably the Solidarity Trade Union in Poland, but also populist actors opposing oligarchs in uh, Latin America. During democratic transition, the role of populism from Mud and Calvossa is ambiguous, but still rather constructive. They will push for free and fair elections to realise the will of the people, but attack elites in power which could disrupt democratic transition. If democratic deepening involves the institutionalisation of reforms that are crucial for improving institutions specialised in the protection of fundamental rights, and the development of a fully fledged liberal democratic regime, 
we can see that populist parties will be at odds with this process and harmful to it. However, democratisation is not a one-way process. When a country is suffering from democratic backsliding, e.g. Hungary, Poland, arguably, populists also have a role to play. Populists help the process of democ uh, democratic erosion by attacking the legitimacy and autonomy of institutions which specialise in the protection of fundamental rights, e.g. Uh, judicial independence, the rule of law, minority rights. Obviously, this ties in again with the will of the people and their support for an extreme majoritarian model of democracy. Hungary, under Orban, is a key example. For democratic breakdown, where a regime moves from electoral democracy to competitive authoritarianism, populists again play an ambiguous but generally supportive role. Uh, they are happy to tilt the rules of the game towards themselves at the expense of the corrupt elite, e.g. Fujimori in Peru, who tried to overcome executive legislative gridlock by suspending the constitution and closing parliament in 1992, arguing he was simply following the will of the people. However, repressiveness, the movement from a competitive authoritarianism to a full authoritarian regime, will be opposed by populism due to its support for popular sovereignty and majority rule, e.g. Belarusian President Lukashenko, who, despite opportunity and rising opposition, has not transformed his competitive authoritarian regime into a fully authoritarian one due to his populist ideology. He justifies his competitive authoritarian regime on the basis of a populist uh, argumentation in which the opposition is painted as a corrupt elite allied to foreign i.e. western powers however for Lukashenko to be able to claim to be the true representative of the pure Belarusian people with some legitimacy he needs a popular contest with his opponents even if the elections are not truly competitive other factors play a role beyond this model for example the political power of populist actors is important if in opposition, populists tend to call for more transparency and the implementation of democracy, e.g. elections, referenda, recall votes, to break the alleged stranglehold of the elite, either in a competitive authoritarian or electoral democratic context. Whilst populists in power have a more complicated relationship with the use of direct democracy and respect for the rules of public contestation. Although it is true that populists defend majority rule, only some of them have more or less consistently used plebiscary uh, instruments. Populist politicians have also used their political power to tilt the electoral playing field in their own favour, as both Correa and Orban have done through constitutional reforms. The type of political uh, system also constrains populists in power. Presidential systems make it easier for populist outsiders to gain power. They often lack support at other levels to push through their agenda, e.g. in the legislature, particularly when they lack a strong party organisation. In contrast, parliamentary regimes tend to limit the power of populists in power because they often lead to coalition governments in which populist parties have to work together with mostly stronger non-populist parties, e.g. the case with the FPO and OVP in Austria, for example, although this isn't always the case. But if a populist actor or a coalition of actors acquires a parliamentary majority, they have fewer counterbalancing forces to contend with. This is most strikingly uh, shown in Hungary, where Orban for a long time could count on a qualified parliamentary majority, allowing him to change the constitution without any prohibitive action uh, by the opposition. The international context is also important. If a country is integrated into a strong network of liberal democracies, such as the EU, it is more difficult, uh, but not impossible, again see Hungary under Orban, for a populist actor to undermine key features of a liberal democracy without international uh, backlash. As you might have noticed, uh, both in terms of real-world examples and scholarly attention, left-wing populism is the poor relation in populism studies. Damiani notes that Podemos, uh, France in Sumis and Syriza were all born and grew to political maturity as attempts to represent a new people with institutional representation, to organise strong protests against government-promoted austerity policies and <clears throat> identified as their adversary uh, the centre-right and centre-left political elite, which was held responsible for their negative records in government. Margaret Canavan in 1981 argued that some populist movements espouse a populist democracy which aims to promote participation and popular sovereignty. From this point of view, populist democracy took the form of radical democracy, 
capable of criticizing indirect democracy models due to the tools provided by direct democracy and its forms of political consultation. Um, this harks back to the category of inclusive populism, which we covered in week eight, I think, which separates populist radical left parties from populist radical right parties, which practice an exclusionary populism. Inclusionary populism is a form aimed at pursuing the political integration of the many categories that result from social fragmentation. It is inherently a post-class based analysis and program approach. The aim of these parties is to broaden democratic borders, followed by the project of including the excluded in the most advanced model of social democracy they are willing to pursue. The ideas that emerge from this form of populism is that of opening, not closing, decisional processes and opening to the plurality of social categories, uh, not only those involving organised interests, which the procedural mechanisms of liberal democracy tend to exclude from the governance of public affairs, not to mention the less wealthy who live and work within the national borders. That's just a fancy way of saying bring more people in, but in slightly uh, obtuse academic phrasing. I don't know why I wrote it like that. Uh, the inclusionary populism of PRLPs, um, populist radical left parties, for those who haven't been paying attention, is aimed in particular at two specific categories of the excluded, migrants and typically uh, gender slash sexual minorities, typically gender minorities, to whom they would like to offer a full path, uh, a path of full social, political and economic inclusion. According to Damani, Rather than representing a risk to the stability of a democratic state, populist radical left parties appeal to a higher degree of political implementation to be pursued by mechanisms of bottom-up participation in order to integrate, rather than substitute, the conventional tools of representative democracy. Um, in terms of democratic principles, the aim of populist radical left parties is to increase the level of social inclusion within and not outside the democratic system by expanding decision-making to non-privileged sections of the population who would otherwise be excluded from policy-making. Uh, this, however, only applies to Europe, as we've seen. In Latin America, populist left-wing parties, uh, or leaders in that case because it's typically more uh, personalistic, have undermined democratic systems and weakened constitutional checks and balances, the rule of law and the media. This might be down to contextual factors. Liberal democracy is much more established and supported in Western Europe, um, means that there's less to gain and a significant reputational risk and often unconstitutional uh, in undermining these systems compared to Latin America. So uh, how should other parties respond to populists? Um, this is a big topic, right? And it probably deserves more than the two slides we've got <laughs> in this whole module, but essentially, um, there's no right answer, right? It depends on context, but we can look at some kind of commonalities or some factors. Uh, on the demand side, if we accept that populist attitudes are relatively widespread in society, just like being on the left or being on the right, um, regardless of whether they've been activated by a populist party with a charismatic leader, then parties can respond to the triggers which allow for populist parties to ride the wave to success. In most cases, they are political corruption and elite unresponsiveness. So corruption scandals or systemic corruption creates fertile breeding ground for populism. Fighting and preventing corruption are crucial strategies for either preventing populist parties from rising or diminishing their importance once they are established. This involves not denying a scandal. It involves not avoiding a proper investigation and being willing um, to perhaps give up members of your own team, your own party, if they're caught to be involved in corruption, right? However, it's reasonable to ask why populists have emerged in contexts where corruption isn't a major issue. So Denmark, the Netherlands, which have seen the emergence of strong populist radical right parties, uh, even though neither systemic corruption nor weak state capacity is a uh, fundamental issue. The reason is elite unresponsiveness, or at least academics argue it's elite unresponsiveness. The prioritization of responsible decision making over uh, giving the people what they want, right? A kind of paternalistic, we know best approach. In some countries with, uh, no, with more experience of coalitions, non-populist parties have formed political cartels, often with the explicit argument to keep populist parties out of power. Obviously, this is a dream come true for the populists as it confirms uh, or reinforces the image 
of fighting a struggle against a political elite. A case in point is, uh, in the UK was membership of the EU, where the political elite believed the responsible decision was to maintain membership when a significant uh, portion of the population did not agree. Similarly, immigration was seen as good by both um, the, uh, by both Labour and under Cameron, the Conservatives, and obviously the Liberal Democrats and the Greens and the SNP implied. So if you were anti-immigration or you wanted lower levels of immigration, there wasn't really a party for you. Even the Conservatives, uh, who promised to bring immigration down into the tens of thousands, were unable to meet that pledge because it was impossible as a member of the EU with freedom of movement. Um, other, for other countries, the European Union has significantly diminished the room of manoeuvre for national governments, right? sometimes even forcing them to implement policies they openly oppose. A good example of this uh, is because of the pressures of international markets and the EU, the Social Democratic governments of José uh, Luis Rodríguez Zapatero in Spain, 2004-2011, uh, and uh, Papandreou in Greece, 2009-2011, they decided to act as responsible agents, right? responsible politicians, by enforcing austerity reforms, which generated frustration amongst voters who felt betrayed and no longer represented by the party. This contributed to the activation of populist sentiment, which ultimately led to Podemos and Syriza, which became established members of the, of the party systems. Now, although this is an extreme example, established parties in the EU are compelled to strike an increasingly difficult balance between responsiveness and responsibility. The better they are to deal with this challenge, which includes being honest about this tension amongst voters, the lesser chances that populism will thrive. Many politicians claim full agency when things go well and almost uh, a complete lack of agency when things go wrong. For example, economic growth is claimed as the success of a government whilst an economic downturn is externalised as a consequence of globalisation or international institutions like the EU, the Euro, the IMF. Essentially, politicians set themselves up for failure by claiming to have more power than they really have. In addition, uh, recent experiences in countries like Greece, where the left populist Syriza government had to succumb to the same economic reality as its treacherous opponents before it, uh, have taken away some of the allure of populist alternatives. This feeds into a broader discussion about the role of technocratic governance. For Muller, at least as far as the current wave of populism in Europe is concerned, I would say that it is the particular approach to addressing the Euro crisis, shorthand technocracy, that is crucial for understanding the present day rise of populism. So in the same way that populists argue there is one true will and one true people, technocrats claim there is one true policy solution. For Miller, or Muller rather, it is, it is plausible to assume that one might pave the way for the other because each legitimises the belief that there is no real room for disagreement. Mudd and Kaltwasser also argue that civic education is important because it allows for socialisation uh, of, of key values into the citizenry, so values around liberal democracy, warnings of the dangers of extremist challenges and the importance of defending liberal values. Um, strong warnings against extremists can backfire though, uh, particularly among groups who are already more distrustful of the political establishment uh, and those who are more sympathetic to uh, populist actors. Then we also have issues on the supply side. So the supply side focuses on the reactions of the establishment to populist parties. The most effective tend to be one, mainstream political actors, two, institutions specialised in the protection of fundamental rights, and three, the media, four, supranational institutions. Mainstream political actors and populist actors are essentially in the same business, politics. As such, they want to reduce the number of votes that populist parties get. Austria is a good uh, case study of how the three main reactions to populist parties can all backfire. Gruber and Bale examined the centre-right People's Party, OVP's, response to the FPO, a populist party, populist radical right. Um, they first of all treated the party like a pariah, so excluded them from government, um, but that didn't work. It made the established political parties look like a cartel, um, and especially when state government, local parties, welcomed the FPO into government, it was weird essentially that the central government that the national government wouldn't so uh the ovp 
uh, decided to adopt or co-opt the FPO. It refused to rule out a coalition with the FPO, um, but all this did was increase the FPO's support because it seemed like a, a new viable option. In office, as a junior party, um, the FPO did lose support, but that was mainly due to an internal party squabble rather than uh, as a consequence of being in government. The FPO was not found out by the pressures of government as many anti-populists say they would be. And they ended the period as a junior partner with 28% of the vote, which is pretty good uh, in Austria. The OVP, the main centre-right party, whilst trying to provide its own answer to migration, seemed to be fueling the FPO. Um, it also met with little success because the FPO could always outbid the OVP, right? So the harsher the OVP went on immigration, the harsher FPO would go. Um, but the OVP would just scare off its mainstream centrist voters. And so it would also increase the salience of the issue, in both cases helping the FPO relative to the OVP. Gruber and Bale conclude that, giving all this... Um, the obvious lesson from Austria is a simple one, but no less important. Parties, non-populist parties, should avoid investing too much time, effort and attention in trying to cure a condition that, in all likelihood, can only be managed. Um, in the same way that we don't talk about how centre-right parties can get rid of centre-left parties, in many cases centre-right parties can't get rid of populist radical right parties. Centre-left parties can't get rid of populist left-wing parties. They just have to be managed like any kind of political party in a party system. Cordon Sanitaire in France does not seem to have worked either, right? Marine Le Pen used to speak of um, the UMPS, which fused the acronym of Sarkozy's right-wing party with that of the Socialists. Uh, and in fact, the Front National has, or now uh, the National Rally, has outlasted both the Socialist Party and the UMP. Um, treating a party as a pariah doesn't seem to work. Institutions specialised in the protection of fundamental rights uh, also play a role. So Supreme Courts are designed specifically to safeguard the liberal democratic system and to protect minority rights against the majority rule. In Central and Eastern Europe, the judiciary has often been the most important counterweight to populist actors, e.g. in uh, Poland and Slovakia. However, this doesn't always work. For example, in Ecuador under Correa and Orban on, in Hungary, where parties manage to fill the judiciary with loyal supporters. Hence, the political context, the relationship between the executive and the judiciary, influence how well these non-legislative checks and balances can operate. Uh, then we also have the media. The media play an important role in explaining the political failure or success of populist forces. E.g. without Fox News uh, and affiliated local media stations, Glenn Beck and Sean Hannity, um, it's difficult to see how the Tea Party would have uh, become such a force in America. UKIP has profited from the open support of the Daily Express and a kind of general um, scepticism of both the EU and migration within the general print media. In some cases, the populists use the media as a springboard into politics, the classic case being Berlusconi, who used his vast media empire to launch his Forza Italia party, uh, which supported him in office. However, in Germany, the media has been very hostile to populist parties of the left and the right. Even the tabloid Bild, which disseminates a strong populist discourse itself, attacks parties like the left populist The Left Party, Die Linke, and the AFD. Still, both parties have thrived. For Mudd and Kaltwaller, uh, this odd love-hate relationship between populist media and politicians, sharing a discourse but not a struggle, is quite common around the world and is a consequence of the fact that even the tabloid media are almost always owned and uh, operated by mainstream forces. Then we have supranational organisations. Uh, examples of Chavez and Orban show that supranational organisations have only modest power vis-à-vis -vis populists. Most nations, run by populists or not, guard their sovereignty jealously, and hence international parties have limited power. Also, the criteria for being eligible to join supranational organisations like the EU are of limited help later. Once a country becomes a member of the club, it has little capacity to monitor its adherence to democracy and the rule of law, and is often loath to kick that member out, lest it looks like the club itself is weakening. So, to conclude... 
Um, all real life strategies fall somewhere between the two poles of full opposition and full cooperation. And in most cases, a contextually aware uh, combination of different strategies is applied. The two most popular suggestions, dismiss and copy, are both bad. Dismissing populists, calling them evil and foolish, plays into the hands of populists who can dismiss, who can depict their political struggle as all against one, one against all. Copying populist parties, however, or offering populism light, um, e.g. the way several Western European social democrats have suggested in an attempt to fight off the populist radical right, further intensify the moralization and polarization of politics and society, um, which fundamentally undermines the foundations of liberal democracy, but also uh, seeks to, well, has the result of justifying um, or validating or collaborating on the core issues the populists aim to mobilize on. So you're just basically helping their issue become more important. And also, whatever you propose, the populists are also willing to go one step further. You won't be able to outbid them on these issues. So for opponents of populism, the best method is to deal with the demand side of populism. What is, what is it voters are railing against? How can these issues be mitigated? Are dialogues open? Are processes democratic? Is there accountability? If not, why? Why do people feel like they are not being listened to? The correct response, according to Mudd and Kaltwasser, uh, to populism involves mainstream actors engaging in an open dialogue with populist actors and supporters. The aim of the dialogue should be to better understand the claims and grievances of populist elites and masses and to develop liberal democratic responses to them. At the same time, practitioners and scholars should focus more on the message than the messenger. Instead of assuming a priori the populists are wrong, they should seriously examine the extent to which the proposed policies have merit within a liberal democratic regime. But uh, they have a warning for mainstream actors. Populists present a different, more complex challenge to democracies than extremists, because you can't just ban populists. Uh, and therefore, they require a different, more complex response. In fact, overreacting to the populist challenge can do more harm than good in the liberal democracy and arguably that's what Labour did under Ed Miliband overreacting to uh, the rise of UKIP because they thought they were weakening Labour much more than the Conservatives and perhaps much more than they actually were. So we've looked at the political responses to populists but how should we respond to populism on a deeper philosophical level? Well firstly having a clear convincing vision of what constitutes the people is vital right Populists have one, so it's important that their rivals in the political sphere also have one. What or who decides membership of the people, other than the historical accident of who is born in a particular place or who happens to be the son and daughter of particular parents? Put simply, the charge against populists that they are exclusionary is a normative one. Right? Every conception of the people is by definition exclusionary. Um, but Liberal Democrats unless they advocate for a world state with one single equal citizenship status, also effectively condone exclusions of all those not part of a particular state. This challenge is known in political theory as the boundary problem. It famously has no obvious democratic solution. To say that the people should decide presumes that we already know who the people are, but that is the very question that demands an answer. In fact, we see here a curious reversal. Populists always distinguish morally between those who properly belong and those who don't even if that moral criteria might ultimately be nothing more than a form of identity politics. Liberal Democrats seem only to appeal to the brute facts or, phased a bit differently, to historical accidents. They can say that de facto certain people are also, you know, real Americans since, after all, they hold American citizenship. But that is just a fact. It's, it's not in and of itself much of a normative claim, right? It kind of just... It doesn't make a convincing argument about what should be, right? which is basically what politics is about. Similarly, populists are anti-pluralist. Liberal Democrats argue that anti-pluralism is in and of itself undemocratic uh, because it's incompatible with the liberal democratic state. But so what, right? Non-populist actors need to explain why that is important. Pluralism, just like its particular variant multiculturalism, is often presented simultaneously as a fact and as a positive normative goal or value. But just like the boundary problem, we're left with the question of why a simple fact should automatically have any moral weight.
Right, there is the issue that pluralism and diversity are not first order values as is, for example, freedom. No one could plausibly say that more pluralism must automatically always be good. It's a political value that has to be justified amongst the body politic. An avenue for liberals here may be John Rawls, who argues that we do not have to accept pluralism because it reflects the reality of the 21st century, or because it's obviously better than the alternative, but merely because it's the only fair way of individuals sharing the same political space whilst uh, respecting their individual dignity and freedom. Finally, if the problem with populists is that they are anti-pluralist or exclusionary, how can the answer to the rise of populism be to be just as exclusionary, right? Liberals must have a very good defence to not look hypocritical in the eyes of the electorate. In fact, for Muller, there is an obligation to engage with populists as long as they stay within the law, but talking to does not equal talking like. If liberals believe in reason and rationality, they must engage in effective debate, but play the ball, not the man. Right? They need to identify the justified complaints of the populists um, and address them in a liberal way, in an authentic way. Erdogan, for example, uh, did not just emerge out of nowhere. Uh, he was doing something democratic when he asserted the presence of what had been dismissed as Black Turks, that is to say, the poor and devout Anatolian masses against the one-sided westernised image of the Turkish Republic celebrated by the Kemalists. The quest for inclusion in Turkey did not have to take the form of populist figures. Arguably, some of the damage uh, to democracy might have been averted had its existing elite been willing to take steps towards both practical and symbolic inclusion of a group of uh, Turkish voters who felt excluded by mainstream politicians. Overall, then, liberals, liberal democrats need to constantly restate and re-justify their founding principles, as well as making sure they practice what they preach, and ensure that the political system is open, accepting, um, and is pluralistic, rather than just open to those who share the kind of same worldview, same ideology, or same background as they do. Even if that is uncomfortable, even if that leads to passionate political debate, because the alternative to shutting people out of the kind of political decision making process, um, leaving them perhaps left behind, is that they become fertile ground for populist parties, which liberal democrats oppose. So, populism is here, it doesn't seem to be going anywhere. And a question I think we should end this module on isn't necessarily, is populism good or bad? Um, because we don't really ask, is socialism good or bad? Is communism good or bad? Is conservatism good or bad? Is liberalism good or bad? Um, or even what is populism, right? We kind of, we finished that in week one. Instead, perhaps we should ask, do we need populism? Or when do we need populism? Yes, populism is challenging for liberal democracy. And for a lot of elements of modern life, many of us hold dear. Minority rights, checks and balances, for example, but it arises as a response to a gap in the market for political ideas. It makes us question, or at least revisit and re-justify, some of the fundamental questions of political society that we thought we'd had boxed off. Right? If you're a Liberal Democrat and suddenly you find 30% of your society backing a populist party, that's not the fault of the populists. That's on you. That's because your vision of a political society has failed to convince significant chunks of people. Populism forces us to ask questions of liberal democracy. Which groups do we not represent well enough, or at least who don't feel represented enough? How can we understand the concerns of populist voters, rather than dismissing them as left-behind relics of a fast-changing society who we should ignore because they might be dead soon anyway? That's not the case. In the UK, we might think that UKIP was the populist radical right party, uh, and it was older voters who tended to back them. Oh, okay, well, that's great. But you go to France and the 18 to 25 year olds uh, turn out to heavily back Le Pen, most of all, the populist radical right. So we can't just assume that everywhere it is older generations who will back populist radical right parties. Liberals, liberal Democrats, uh, those who value liberal democracy need to have an answer to populists. They need to convince people the pluralism is worth defending. They need to tell people about their own vision of the people. They need to tell people why they should also buy into that vision. They need to convince them. They need to do politics.
They need to bring people into the political community who don't feel like they have a voice or they have a role. And it should be obvious that liberals will never be able to convince everyone, right? Um, and I'm talking about liberals, small L, right? So every, non-populist actors, they're never going to be able to convince everybody because the foundation of politics is disagreement on how we live the good life. But there is a reason why we have seen populist parties emerge by and large over the last 30 years, especially in Western Europe. And that is because for a large group of voters, politics uh, isn't working. And instead of complaining about the rise of populist actors, liberals need to recognise that it is the populist actors who are providing answers to the problems that these kind of outsider voters are feeling. And instead of complaining about the populist actors, liberal Democrats need to provide answers of their own. Because po politics is about disagreement, and disagreement remains at the heart of electoral politics. So instead of wishing the populists would just go away, liberals need to think about what it is the populists are addressing and think of their own answers to these deep um, and probably unsolvable questions.